Today, we are zeroing in on one of the most critical areas in intensive care. Yeah. The pharmacological agents we use for hemodynamic instability and shock. Right. Okay, let's start with the absolute foundation. What is the physiological failure that we call shock? At its core, shock is just inadequate tissue perfusion. It means the cells aren't getting enough oxygen, and that leads to, you know, cellular hypoxia. It's a true metabolic emergency. So if the problem is flow, what is the one goal we absolutely have to hit with our initial vasoactive therapy? The goal is to get that mean arterial pressure back up to a level that perfuses the vital organ. And that number is? We're typically targeting a mean arterial pressure above 65 millimeters of mercury. That's really seen as the minimum pressure you need to get blood into the brain, the kidneys, and the gut. To hit that target, we're using some incredibly potent molecules. How do they actually work inside the body? They work by targeting specific receptors. We're mainly talking about adrenergic, dopaminergic, and uh, vasopressin receptors. The clinical effect you get depends entirely on which of those receptors an agent hits and how strongly it hits them. Let's do a quick fire round on those targets. Stimulate alpha-1, what happens? Alpha-1 receptors are in the vascular smooth muscle. You stimulate them, you get vasoconstriction. Simple as that. It's our main tool for raising pressure. Okay, what about beta-1 in the heart? Beta-1 receptors are in the myocardium itself. Hitting them increases heart rate, which is chronotropy, and also the force of contraction, the anotropy. It just gives the heart a big boost. Now, beta-2, this is the one that often complicates things, right? Where is it and what does it do? It does. Beta-2 receptors are in vascular smooth muscle and the bronchioles. But unlike alpha-1, stimulating beta-2 causes vasodilation. Ah, so you could be trying to raise the pressure but inadvertently drop it if your drug has too much beta-2 activity. Exactly. It can work against you. And finally, V1 receptors. They're non-adrenergic. What's their role? V1 receptors are also in vascular smooth muscle. Stimulating them causes very potent vasoconstriction, but through a completely different pathway than our catecholamines. Which makes them a great alternative if a patient becomes resistant to the standard agents. Precisely. It gives you another tool in the toolbox. Okay, with the target set, let's classify the agents. First up, pure vasopressors. When do we reach for these? You use pure vasopressors when the main issue is just massive vasodilation. I mean, pathologically low, systemic vascular resistance. So this is distributive shock, septic neurogenic. Exactly. Septic shock, neurogenic shock, anaphylactic shock. The pump is often fine, but the pipes are just far too wide. Vasopressin is a key agent in this class. Why is it usually a second-line agent? What's the benefit of adding it? Well, it targets those V1 receptors, so it completely bypasses the adrenergic system. Oh, yeah. We add it as a second-line agent in refractory septic shock when a patient is already on a high dose of norepinephrine. And by adding it, you can. You can often significantly lower the dose of norepinephrine you need, which might reduce the side effects from all those high-dose catecholamines. Okay, let's talk about phenylephrine. It's a pure alpha-1 agonist. On paper, that sounds perfect for raising pressure, but it has a major downside. It does. It will raise the mean arterial pressure, no question. The problem is, because it has zero beta-1 activity, the body's burrow flex kicks in hard. And that causes? Reflex bradycardia. The heart rate plummets. So if you drop the heart rate while you're trying to fix shock, you can actually decrease your cardiac output. It can be really dangerous if there's any underlying cardiac dysfunction. And there's a newer agent for patients on max doses of everything else, angiotensin 2. Right. Angiotensin 2 is another potent non-adrenergic vasoconstrictor. It's really an adjunctive, sort of a salvage therapy for distributive shock when you've run out of other options. Okay, let's switch gears to the second group, pure inotropes. When is the problem not the pipes, but the pump itself? This is when you're dealing with myocardial pump failure. So we're talking about cardiogenic shock or advanced heart failure. These patients are often already vasoconstricted, cold and clammy, but their heart just can't move blood forward. Dubutamine is the classic here. What's its mechanism and what is the big clinical pitfall you have to watch out for? Dubutamine is mostly a beta-1 agonist, so it's great for contractility. The pitfall, though, is that it also has significant beta-2 activity. Which means vasodilation. Exactly. So if your patient isn't well fluid resuscitated, that beta-2 vasodilation can actually make their hypotension worse, even while the heart is squeezing harder. Wait, so you're saying you give a drug for low blood pressure that could lower it even more? Yeah. That seems risky. It is a risk you have to manage. That's why dobutamine is often used together with a presser like norepinephrine to balance out that vasodilatory effect. Then there's milrinone. 
what makes it so unique, especially for patients who are on beta blockers. Milrinone is totally different. It's a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, so it bypasses the beta receptors entirely. This is huge for patients on chronic beta blockers because their receptors are already blocked. So it can still boost heart function. Yes, it improves both contractility or anotropy and diastolic relaxation, which we call lusotropy, without being blocked by their existing meds. And what about isoproterenol? Where does that fit in? Isoproterenol is a non-selective beta agonist. We almost exclusively use it for its chronotropic effects, for raising the heart rate in symptomatic bradycardia or heart block. It's not really a shock agent because it causes so much vasodilation. Okay, so we've had agents for the pipes and agents for the pump, but often we need to fix both. That brings us to the third group, the inopressors. Right, the mixed action agents. They give you a balance of both vasoconstriction and inotropy, which makes them the go-to for complex or mixed shock states. Let's compare the big ones, starting with the standard of care for most distributive shock. Norpinephrine, what's its receptor profile? Norpinephrine is perfect because it's significantly more alpha-1 than beta-1. It gives you that strong vasoconstriction to raise the systemic vascular resistance and mean arterial pressure, but it has just enough beta-1 kick to maintain cardiac output. And why did it beat out older agents like dopamine? In a word, safety. The data is pretty clear that norepinephrine causes fewer serious arrhythmias than dopamine. And in septic shock, the last thing you need is an unstable rhythm. Now, epinephrine. Gold standard for cardiac arrest. How is it used in refractory shock? Epinephrine hits everything, alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. It will raise systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output, and heart rate like nothing else. The problem is that the intense beta-1 stimulation really increases myocardial oxygen demand. So it can make a stressed heart ischemic. It can, so you save it for when norepinephrine isn't enough, or for specific cases like anaphylaxis, where you also need that beta-2 bronchodilation. And dopamine. It's fallen out of favor, but its dose-dependent effects are critical to understand. Can you walk us through the three ranges? Absolutely. At low doses, say 2 to 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, it's hitting dopaminergic receptors, which was thought to protect the kidneys, so that's not really a modern practice. Okay, the moderate dose. In the middle, at 5 to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, the beta-1 effects take over. You get increased contractility and heart rate. And at high doses. Above 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, it's all alpha-1. You get profound vasoconstriction, a lot like high-dose norepinephrine, but with a much, much higher risk of tachyrrhythmias. Which is exactly why we've moved away from it. That's right. Okay, let's quickly recap the profiles for our pure agents, vasopressin again. It targets V1 receptors. It's for refractory shock. The effect is an increase in systemic vascular resistance and mean arterial pressure. Think of it as a catecholamine-sparing agent. And dobutamine. It targets beta-1 much more than beta-2. The indication is cardiogenic shock. The effect is increased cardiac output, but, and this is the key thing, it simultaneously decreases systemic vascular resistance. Moving on to probably the most important topic, safety and administration. What is the absolute preferred vascular access for these agents? It has to be a central venous catheter, no question. This is to minimize the catastrophic risk of extravasation, where the drug leaks into the tissue. But in an emergency, you might have to start peripherally. If you do, what are the two non-negotiable safety rules? First, you have to use a large bore intravenous line, an 18 or 16 gauge, in a big proximal vein like the antecubital fossa. Second, you must transition to a central line as soon as you possibly can. Peripheral is only a bridge. We've talked about fluid status. Let's make the rule explicit. You must ensure the patient has adequate fluid resuscitation before you start, or at the very least at the same time. Giving a presser to a dry, hypovolemic patient is just, oh. Well, you're clamping down on empty vessels. It kills tissue perfusion. What monitoring is mandatory during these infusions? Continuous mean arterial pressure monitoring. And you really want that from an intra-arterial line for beat-to-beat -beat accuracy. Also, continuous electrocardiogram monitoring is mandatory to watch for arrhythmias from all that beta-1 stimulation. And the worst case scenario, catecholamine extravasation. The infusion infiltrates the tissue. What's the immediate action? Stop the infusion. Immediately. Then try to aspirate any drug left in the catheter. Yeah. You have to act fast. Time is tissue. And what's the pharmacological antidote to reverse it? You infiltrate the area with phentolamine. Phentolamine is an alpha blocker. It directly counteracts that intense localized vasoconstriction and helps restore blood flow to the tissue. This has been an incredibly valuable synthesis of the pharmacology and the clinical reality.
The big takeaway has to be that we're treating physiology, not just a number on the screen. Understanding these receptor profiles is what lets you go beyond a simple protocol and really tailor the therapy. We start with norepinephrine for distributive shock, and the target is a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury. But that's just a starting point. What's the final thought our listeners at the bedside should take with them? I think the question you have to ask yourself, considering how dose-dependent some agents are and how things like beta blockers can change everything, is this. How often are you reassessing your strategy based on actual evidence of perfusion-like lactate clearance or urine outlet, rather than just being fixated on hitting a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury? Are you treating the number or are you actually treating the patient's shock state? That is the right question to ask on every single shift. Thank you for this absolutely essential synthesis.